the Industrial Revolution made some progress for man. It was another of those extraordinary jumps forward in the story of civilization, like the changeover from hunter to farmer. Stephen Gardner, 1975. The British Industrial Revolution was a great advancement in technology, where in a short number of decades, many industries became more efficient. These industries included the agriculture and farming industry, the mining industry, the production of household goods, and the textile industry, which is the primary example of the Industrial Revolution to many people. The Industrial Revolution brought changes beyond industry. Positive changes included goods being more readily available, and luxuries were now accessed by a wider number of people. People started thinking about change. The Industrial Revolution also brought changes that were not so positive. Work was long and hard, and many people were hurt or killed on the job. Pay was low, and workers had no representation and almost no rights. Throughout this period, the world was revolutionized in ways that still affect the lifestyle of the modern world. Britain had come to a place in the early 18th century where its society was relatively open and allowed for some social mobility. Um, where there was a reward given to those who were innovative um, and they had the right combination of natural resources so that they could experiment with inventions and expand um, those productive techniques that were most successful. A prime example of how the Industrial Revolution changed British cities was the city of Manchester. In 1750 Manchester was little more than a village with a population of less than 15,000 people. The majority of citizens of Manchester were farmers. Those that weren't were most likely part of the cottage industry producing household goods and cloth in their own homes or small shops. James Wheeler, in his 1836 book Manchester of Political, Social, and Commercial History, described it this way. Until the 18th century, the machinery for conducting every process of manufacture was rude in structure and slow in operation. Workmen were not then as now, collected in factories under the eye of vigilant superintendents, but the house of every man was his workshop, and, wages being high in proportion to the price of provisions, each individual suited his term of labor to his own inclination. Over the next few years, water wheels started to power factories. James Hargreaves invented the spinning jenny, which could lessen the time that it took to spin thread. Many textile factories were built along rivers to get power for the machines from the water wheels. This called for workers and created many jobs. By 1780, Manchester had reached a population of over 20,000. Most of these people were workers in textile mills on the Irwell River. Manchester was growing very fast with the improving technology of the British Industrial Revolution. Rivers were needed to power factories because water wheels ran on running water, and the only source of running water was rivers. This was all about to change. James Watt's steam engine was an integral part of the Industrial Revolution. Rather than using a water mill, Watt's engine ran off of coal and steam and could power a factory, which meant that they could be built almost anywhere and not merely near running water. Watt's assistant then made an improvement to the steam engine so that it could be made to turn a wheel. This made water wheels almost obsolete. Steam was clearly the future for factories. This made the demand for laborers and workers higher than ever. This was a time of excessive growth for the city of Manchester. During the early 1800s, Manchester had a large number of factories that were powered by steam. It was also becoming a very unhappy place to live. Elizabeth Gaskell, a period author, wrote a novel called North and South based upon conditions observed during that time. In the novel, she has some characters visit Milton, which represents Manchester. For several miles before they reached Milton, they saw a deep lead-colored cloud hanging over the horizon in the direction in which it lay. It was all the darker from contrast with the pale gray-blue of the wintry sky. Nearer to the town, the air had a faint taste and smell of smoke. Perhaps, after all, more loss of the fragrance of grass and herbage than any positive taste or smell. Quick, they were whirled over long, straight, hopeless streets of regularly built houses, all small and of brick. Here and there, a great oblong many-windowed factory stood up like a hen among her chickens, puffing out black, unparliamentary smoke and sufficiently accounting for the cloud which Margaret had taken to foretell rain. Pollution filled the air, the crime rate went up, the death toll skyrocketed, and many children, some as young as six years old, were forced to work long hours in dark rooms. By the 1840s, Manchester had reached a population of over 300,000. Manchester had also become a somewhat more orderly town, but the pollution rate was still very high. Crime was down to some extent, but the death toll kept rising. 
Frederick Engels' words in 1845 in his essay The Condition of the Working Class in England attacked the British Industrial Revolution's advancements and their effect on the working class. The dwellings of the workers in the worst portions of the cities, together with the other conditions of the life of this class, engender numerous diseases, as is attested on all sides. If one roams the streets a little in the early morning, when the multitudes are still on their way to the work, one is amazed at the number of people who look wholly or half consumptive. Even in Manchester the people have not the same appearance. These pale, lank, narrow-chested, hollow-eyed ghosts whom one passes at every step. In competition with consumption stands typhus, that universally diffused affliction, as is attributed by the official report on the sanitary condition of the working class, directly to the bad state of the dwellings in the matters of ventilation, drainage, and cleanliness. To the modern student, it is hard to understand why anyone would be willing to subject themselves to the harsh working conditions of factories. Why would someone willingly give up a farm field for a job at a factory? That's a very good question. We often wonder, why would anyone take a job where they had to work 14 to 16 hours in very harsh conditions? But I think there's, there are two important things to keep in mind. The first is that oftentimes, workers were already displaced from their agricultural lives because of improvements in agricultural technology and because of enclosure of common land. Second, uh, for a lot of these workers, uh, a 14 to 16 hour day uh, was nothing new. Uh, they, were experienced, they had experienced that uh, in the, on the farm, uh, the adults and the children alike. The English population had been made aware of the dangerous and degrading practices of the industrial employers through the works of authors such as Charles Dickens. Parliament followed soon behind and responded to the outcry by creating child labor laws. Parliament passed bills like the Health and Morals of Apprentices Act of 1802 and the Factory Acts of 1819 and 1831. These acts said that children under the age of 9 couldn't work and children aged 9 to 16 couldn't work more than 12 hours each day or 66 hours each week. These bills were not very effective, however, because they did not provide inspectors. This meant that the government had no way of knowing whether a factory was following the acts or not. This changed with the Factory Act of 1833, which shortened the children's workdays to eight hours and provided inspectors. The British Industrial Revolution truly reformed the city of Manchester. In less than 100 years, the city's population was increased by a factor of 20. The Industrial Revolution changed more than just the city of Manchester. It paved the way for later advancements in technology as well as giving the world many inventions and organizational innovations. The Industrial Revolution created new wealth. But with this new wealth came new ways to exploit people who were not as prosperous, and this reminded us that we should take action if we are to protect the weak. But how has the British Industrial Revolution influenced our modern lifestyle today? The easiest thing to pick up on is our material goods and possessions. They're in an abundance that nobody would have anticipated prior to the Industrial Revolution. But, Arnold Toynbee, a 19th century British historian, remarked about the Industrial Revolution that it was just it was more than simply production of goods. He thought, saw it as a complete alteration in the nature and potential of human society. And what he had in mind was the production of something like the two yards of cloth needed to make a garment, which had taken weeks or at least several days to even weave in the pre-industrial age. Now only took minutes, and then by the end of the century, um, even seconds. And what was applied to cloth and garments became part of how you produce iron tools and porcelain dishes and everything else that we can think of in the modern world. This led to simply more goods. It meant that things that had once been rare were now common and that more people had opportunity to get a hold of them. And in some people's minds, it leads to the anticipation that you could end absolute poverty as it was understood because there would be enough for everybody to have some of the basic necessities of life. On another track, it leads to some interesting new ideas about commerce and about the interaction between countries who trade with one another. A very famous organization or group of thinkers called the Manchester School began to discuss and argue even in Parliament that international trade was such a good thing that it would lead to the ending of international wars. Because if you are dependent upon another country for raw materials or they're your customers that you're selling to, you're less likely to attack them. You don't shoot your suppliers or kill your customers. It's bad for business. The British Industrial Revolution truly reformed the production of goods. Not only that, it was a formative influence on the way we think about society and our fellow man.